The people of West Virginia are a proud people, rich in heritage, rich in tradition, rich in dignity. While their affluence does not rank them among the nation's wealthy, these people of the Appalachian region have preserved the best of the past and are using it as a springboard to a better future, both culturally and economically. They treasure their arts, their crafts, their music. For young and old, these are important parts of their lives. Lives lived partly in the present and partly in the peaceful, relaxed atmosphere of the past. Lives of fulfillment, tradition, dignity. Making them truly the proud people. Continuing the crafts of the region is an important aspect of the culture. Miss Lucy Quarier has preserved the ancient art of spinning using this hundred-year-old spinning wheel. She uses none of the modern conveniences but spins her flax in the tradition of the wheel and the foot-powered treadle as she does her daily work. Skilled hands work their knowing way to fashion the flax into thread. Thread which is gathered on the bobbin. The ancient art of spinning is one of the many handicrafts that are being passed from generation to generation. Sarah Bogus, an apprentice weaver, is learning to operate a foot-powered loom for traditional ribbon weaving under Miss Quarier's supervision. The product of this weaving process will be sold, providing economic support for Miss Quarier as well as teaching Sarah to make her own livelihood. This loom is an example of the kind that was used by the early settlers of the country, many of whom were Scottish, Irish, English, and Welsh. Youngsters like Sarah are fortunate because they combine work in an art form with a future means of livelihood. This is Pemberton Clyde who manufactures a traditional toy called the Mountain Bolo. His business had a slow start, but steadily enough money was earned to purchase this modern lathe for turning native wood into delightful toys toys which he will sell all over the country through a distributor. He hopes to expand his business to the point that he can build a larger, more modern shop for greater production volume. Another craftsman, Mr. Postalweight, uses an ordinary pocket knife to fashion a different mountain toy, one of many he makes. I'll make the women do. I have made the plow. The ox yoke. We made the rocking chair. How did you get started making these? Well, <laughs> I was at the word. <laughs> but uh, what were you doing before that? I'll be farming a little bit and work for farmers. And Worked in timber, mostly, sawmills. You making pretty much money making these? Oh, starting to. A little slow to start with, but we're doing pretty good now. Did your wife help you pretty much? Or yeah. She watch? Quite a bit. Oh, yeah. I'm ready to rest right now. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> want a cup of coffee, go drink it. I'm going to stay in with you, go get it. <laughs> Work when you want to and rest when you want to. For the postal weights, resting means a number of things, including demonstrating how the flipper dinger, one of his toys, works.
It's not as easy to use as it looks. Here's a selection of mountain toys. A ladder back chair and a thing on a string. A bean bag and a sky hook. A plow and a paperweight. A Boston rocker. A rocking chair made from a soda pop can. And then the other way. Uh, Dick well, Schnocky is a pioneer in developing the area's cottage industries. He's an entrepreneur encouraging people who might otherwise be on relief to develop their arts and crafts at home to provide them with an income. This toy is a cornstalk fiddle. It's too bad I'm not a musician or I could uh, really play you a tune. It can be played very well, but I can't play a real one, so that's about all could be expected from me. This is the do-nothing machine. It does a good job of it. We haven't found anything it's good for yet, but it's a lot of fun. This is the buzz saw, we call it. Some used to call it in a smaller version. The thing on the string, or a button on the string. And it's good exercise, too. This toy is a little bit difficult until you learn the principle, and it's quite easy. The idea is to make these balls counter-rotate with one another, like this. Oh, I didn't do a very good job on that. This is a flipper dinger. It's made of an elder branch, which has been hollowed out with a 22 caliber cleaning brush. It illustrates the principle of physics. A cornstalk pith ball will float on an airstream, the object being to hook it on this little hoop at the top. on that one. Have here a sky hook. You may have heard of these things, but this is an actual sky hook. It'll balance on the tip of your finger. Only if you have a belt in it. Would you believe it? Gives you quite an eerie feeling. These toys have been made for generations by natives of the Appalachian region until it's become almost a forgotten art. We're trying to bring back this art and it's been found to be of considerable interest to people because there's a lot of heritage involved in it. And toys today are different. Most of the toys are plastic toys today. And when something different like this comes along, there is a tremendous amount of interest in it. There also is a, quite a possible economic impact on people of this region. In as much as they can gain an income from this. Several families working with me are already have experienced this. Uh, I hope to expand this into as may maybe 40 families could be involved in it. And I think by this time other crafts would catch on, not only in the toy field, but in metalworking, pottery, weaving, and the many, many crafts that uh, we could have. I, I think that West Virginia could become a center for the production of crafts and certainly would increase our tourism and our entire economic picture. I think it's much larger 
potential here than what uh, most people would uh, believe. Incidentally, I'm not a native of this state, though I'm more of a native today probably than uh, many of the real natives. I've only been here for about 12 years, and uh, I think this is the most uh, marvelous state in the United States, and I've traveled to all of them. I think we have the natural beauty here that uh, is unsurpassed anywhere. It's a forgotten area. Our population is declining, and I'm sort of glad of it at this point. We're not overcrowded. Someday, the rest of the country is going to discover West Virginia, and then I guess maybe uh, we might be spoiled a little bit. But uh, when they do, I think it's going to be the playground of at least eastern uh, United States. In contrast to the cottage industries, the Viking Glassworks is one of the few manufacturing plants in the country where handwork is still done. Here, glass is hand-pressed and hand-finished. In another unusual process, molten glass is swung into shape. Glass swinging is an almost lost art. This still hot, free-form decanter will soon be part of Viking's large selection of handcrafted glass objects, objects for sale in markets throughout the United States. A very different product is this doll made entirely of waste corn materials, one of the many native substances used by the craftsmen of West Virginia. Even the doll's hair is braided corn silk. Mrs. Lorene Lewis of Hamlin tells us about the process. In the, this little hat, you make a three braid plaid and sew it together, and it makes a little hat for the doll. And then this little basket or a pocketbook, either one you want to call it, this is a little bit big for a pocketbook, but it's a nice little basket. It's braided and sewed together and with a little handle on it. And that's about, you draw the face on pretty good as you can. I'm not a very good artist at that. <laughs> These corn husk dolls, which Mrs. Lewis makes, are representative of some of America's earliest toys. Seats for chairs and stools are also made from corn husks. Another thriving local craft is basket weaving. Mr. Linville splits oak saplings into reeds for his baskets, which he then fashions entirely by hand. This 89-year-old gentleman is still very active at his craft. He is aided in this enterprise by his 69-year-old son, Burnus. Jane Cox of West Virginia University's Heritage Program talks to the Linvilles about basket making. It's funny. It looks to me like that the wood would split off, you know. How do you keep it even? Oh, well, it's you. You've got the line house. Yeah. You need somebody to take an interest in it and try to make, make these baskets. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't see how people ever made out this long without baskets. Mm -hmm. Now, when you Good begin job. this basket, you begin with two thick pieces. One goes all the way around this way. Yes, put these here together first. This here and this here up here. Uh-huh. We get together first. And yeah. then you begin the weaving right here on right the side. Here. Don't you? Right here. And uh, you begin with only a few of the ribs in there. Yeah. And then you I keep adding uh, them. here now. I mm -hmm. use one here, one here, two here. One on each side of this, and two are just the same on the both sides. You've got to have... In other words, you got four over here, you got to have four over here, haven't you? Yeah, you got to, you've got four, you've got to stay, you know, well, you've got ten, and you start with it. Two on top, you got to hardly ever count them. You've got two to start with. These widely varying baskets are a unique and productive expression of the mountain craftsman's art. A 
Another expression of Appalachian creativity is this unusual stringed instrument described to us by Tim Cox. This is a mountain dulcimer. It's an instrument that I believe very native to the Appalachian region, uh, especially West Virginia, and maybe Kentucky and North Carolina, uh, a couple parts of, a few parts of Tennessee. The instrument is uh, of questionable origin. The actual dulcimer is another instrument, uh, and uh, it's a hammered instrument similar to the piano. But this one is called a dulcimer, and so most people distinguish it by calling it a mountain dulcimer. The instrument, uh, as I said, has a, a vague ancestry, but as, as well as I think can be determined, uh, the instrument came from uh, English, Scottish, maybe even some German roots, and when it came to this country, it evolved into its present form. It has three strings, although sometimes it has four, and sometimes it even only has two or maybe five. Since it's never been produced in a factory, there's never been a standardization of design or of strings or of the style in which it's played. Uh, actually, this is the most traditional design. If you find old dulcimers around, you'll find them with the double curve, with the, with the neck extending the full length of the body. These are about, this is about the only uh, rule for a dulcimer is that it has the, the sounding box underneath the neck and the neck runs the entire length of the body. Tim, in his small basement workshop, is one of the few manufacturers of mountain dulcimers. He fashions them using simple hand tools. His business has grown to the point that now he has a sizable backlog of orders from all over the country. He hopes to expand the interest in these instruments by making them available in the larger city markets. I began making dulcimers about six years ago uh, as a result of meeting a a uh, fellow West Virginian at an art and craft fair we had here in state. He sort of challenged me. He said uh, if I was 14 and I was in craft work at that time, I should get into something more challenging. What would be more challenging than getting into something like dulcimers? Because there were very few dulcimer makers, and, and as he knew it, he was the only one left in the state at that time. It would be a uh, pretty interesting thing to do. Not very profitable, he said, but uh, very fulfilling. Well, unfortunately, he died before I got a chance to learn a whole lot from him, but he gave me the original challenge, and I took it from there. And I learned from other dulcimer makers, and, uh, well, this is where I am today. Most of the European counterparts. Here's a completed mountain dulcimer held by Franklin George, who now tells us about another kind of dulcimer, the hammered dulcimer. Back. And this is the hammer dulcimer. <coughs> this is an ancient instrument, also believed to have been brought from near the Middle East to British Isles by the Crusaders, and thence to America. Used to be fairly common. Now it's quite rare, and the players are rare. It is the uh, forerunner of a piano, ancestor of the familiar piano. They are mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Daniels, as an instrument in Nebuchadnezzar's band. And we know similar things existed in Persia and Turkey as long as 5,000 years ago. This one weighs about 30 pounds. It's played with these small uh, pieces of white oak split off the edge of shingles. These are split right off of the... <coughs> Singles used to make a shake roof with. They're thick down here, thin here, and bent up slightly to form the mallet. You have a C scale on this side with a flat seven. C scale plus a one note, eight notes plus one, nine, a C to C plus a D with a flat here. And on this side, of course, a G scale with a flat seven. G to G plus an A.
We'll try to play both kind of dulcimers together. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Back in the hills, beyond the electric power lines, is another craftsman's shop. One of the characteristics of the Appalachian craftsman is his ingenuity. Genus Cottrell makes fine banjos using pieces of automobiles and local timber. He fashions them with draw knife, foot vise, and foot powered lathe. With an artisan's pride, Genus tells us how he constructs his banjos. Well, folks, to tell you. How they're built. Here is a rim. This is the starter, the body of the banjo. It's a, a Buick uh, transmission band out of a Buick transmission. And I cut them down here to the right width. Drill my holes for the brackets that goes on here. And then I put the brackets on. And then I dress out the neck out of black walnut wood shape it down, fit it to the rim, and then I lay off a fret position. Then I put in these white white spots you see in the in the between the frets. The first thing. Then I put in the frets after I put in the position dots. I put in them. And then I fit the key. And then I fit this to this rim. And it's pretty well completed then. And then I take some part of the paint off of some of the rims, where you could see the tone ring from the top side, but you can't see nothing in the center. And some of them, I take all the paint off, but you can see everything clear. And they all have the same position dots, same type keys. This is a, an unfinished banjo, not quite finished. It lacks the keys, and it lacks the tailpiece, and it lacks the armrest and strings, and varnish the neck, and it's completed. This is the last one, till I complete this one that's right here. Now that's the way banjos is made, and here is how I bust out my timber to, to get the uh, necks to start with. A large piece of uh, square timber. Don't look like you can make anything out of it. But whenever I get through with it, it's shaped to a banjo neck. Piece of wood like this. I believe that's about the best I can explain as to how they're made. In this trio, Genus is joined by John and David Morris for an impromptu session. music, arts, and crafts are important to the people of West Virginia, there are both formal and informal programs for passing on the skills from generation to generation. Here at a heritage weekend at West Virginia University, many craftsmen from all over the state come to share their knowledge and experience with the young. Ken Snyder, president of the West Virginia Artists and Craftsmen's Guild, talks with a group of youngsters about his specialty, wood carving. 
The university's facilities are made available for these lectures and demonstrations in a program whose total concept is the preservation and perpetuation of a proud heritage. Ken's carvings are of many different things, executed in a variety of woods and crafted primarily with an ordinary pocket knife. He reports that sales of craft products are rapidly rising and may offer future opportunity for these youngsters, as well as providing them a means of carrying on the traditions of their forefathers. The joys of their mountain heritage are perhaps best expressed in the songs, passed from generation to generation, evolving slowly through the years. In many ways, this music is contemporary, yet it preserves the flavor of a civilization that goes back far into the unrecorded past of the region. Folklore and folk song reinforce written history. Artisans lead the young in cultural expressions which harmonize the best of the past with the promise of the future. Oh, yeah.